This is part two of the conjurer made off with a dish by Naguib Mahfouz. <clears throat> the boy is trying to buy more beans, but he is distracted by a magician. I slipped in among them and found the conjurer looking straight at me. A stupefying joy overwhelmed me. I was completely taken out of myself. With the whole of my being, I became involved in the tricks of the rabbits and the eggs and the snakes and the ropes. When the man came up to collect money, I drew back mumbling, I haven't got any money. He rushed at me savagely and I escaped only with difficulty. I ran off, my back almost broken by the, his blow, and yet I was utterly happy as I made my way to the cellar of beans. Beans with linseed oil for a piaster, mister, I said. He went on looking at me without moving, so I repeated my request. Give me the dish, he said angrily. The dish? Where was the dish? Had I dropped it while running? Had the conjurer made off with it? Boy, you're out of your mind. I retraced my steps, searching along the way for the lost dish. The place where the conjurer had been, I found empty. But the voices of children led me to him in a nearby lane. <clears throat> I moved around the circle. When the conjurer spotted me, he shouted out threateningly, Pay up, or you'd better scram! The dish! I called out despairingly. What dish, you little devil? Give me back the dish. Scram, or I'll make you into food for snakes. He had stolen the dish, yet fearfully I moved away out of sight and wept in grief. Whenever a passerby asked me why I was crying, I would reply, Oh, the conjurer made off with the dish. Through my misery, I became aware of a voice saying, Come along and watch. I looked behind me and saw a peep show had been set up. I saw dozens of children hurrying toward it and taking it in turns to stand in front of the peepholes while the man began his tantalizing commentary to the pictures. There, you've got a gallant knight and the most beautiful of all ladies, Zanat Albanat. My tears dried up, and I gazed in fascination at the box, completely forgetting the conjurer and the dish. Unable to overcome the temptations, I paid over the piaster and stood in front of the peephole next to a girl who was standing in front of the other one. An enchanting picture stories flowed across our vision. When I came back to my own world, I realized I had lost both the piaster and the dish, and there was no sign of the conjurer. However, I gave no thought to the loss. So taken up was I with the pictures of chivalry, love, and deeds of daring. I forgot my hunger. I forgot even the fear of what threatened me, what threatened me at home. I took a few paces back so as to lean against the ancient wall of what had once been a treasury and the chief Cadi's seat of office. And I gave myself up wholly to my reveries. For a long while I dreamed of chivalry, 
of Zainat al-Banat <coughs> and the ghoul. In my dream, I spoke aloud, giving meaning to my words with gestures. Thrusting home the imaginary lance, I said, Take that, O oh ghoul, right in the heart. And he raised Zanat al-Banat up behind him on the horse, came back a gentle voice. I looked to my right and saw a young girl who had been beside me at the performance. She was wearing a dirty dress and colored clogs and was playing with her, with her long plait of hair. In her other hand were the red and white sweets called Lady's Fleas, which she was leisurely sucking. We exchanged glances and I lost my heart to her. Let's sit down and rest, I said to her. She appeared to go along with my suggestion, so I took her by the arm and we went through the gateway of the ancient wall and sat down on a step of its stairway that went nowhere. A stairway that rose up <coughs> until it ended in a platform behind which there could be seen the blue sky and minarets. We sat in silence, side by side. I pressed her hand and we sat on in silence, not knowing what to say. I experienced feelings that were new, strange, and obscure. Putting my face close to hers, I breathed in the natural smell of her hair, mingled with an odor of dust and the fragrance of breath mixed with the aroma of sweets. I kissed her lips. I swallowed my saliva, which had taken on a sweetness from the dissolved ladies' fleas. I put my arm around her without her uttering a word, kissing her cheek and lips. Her lips grew still as they received the kiss and then went back to sucking at the sweets. At last, she decided to get up. I seized her arm anxiously. Sit down, I said. I'm going, she said simply. Where to, I asked this dejectedly. <coughs> to the midwife, Amali, and she pointed to a house on the ground floor, of which was a small ironing shop. Why? To tell her to come quickly. Why? My mother's crying in pain at home. She told me to go to the midwife, Amali, and tell her to come along quickly. And you'll come back after that? She nodded her head in assent and went off. Her mentioning her mother reminded me of my own, and my heart missed a beat. Getting up from the ancient stairway, I made my way back home. I wept out loud, a tried method by which I would defend myself. I expected she would come to me, but she did not. I wandered from the kitchen to the bedroom, but found no trace of her. Where had my mother gone? When would she return? I was fed up with being in the empty house. A good idea occurred to me. I took a dish from the kitchen and a piaster from my savings and went off immediately to the cellar of beans. I found him asleep on a bench outside the shop, his face covered by his arm. The pots of beans had vanished, and the long-necked bottles of oil had been put back on the shelf, and the marble counter had been washed down. Mister, I whispered, approaching. Hearing nothing but his snoring, I touched his shoulder. He raised his arm in alarm and looked at me through reddened eyes. Mister! What do you want? He asked roughly, becoming aware of my presence and recognizing me. A piaster's worth of beans and linseed oil. Eh? I've got the piaster and I've got the dish. You're crazy boy, he shouted at me. Get out or I'll bash your brains in. When I did not move, he pushed me so violently I went sprawling on my back. 
I got up painfully, struggling to hold back the crying that was twisting my lips. My hands were clenched, one on the dish and the other on the piaster. I threw him an angry look. I thought about returning home with my hopes dashed, but dreams of heroism and valor altered my plan of action. Resolutely, I made a quick decision and with all my strength threw the dish at him. It flew through the air and struck him on the head. While I took to my heels, heedless of everything, I was convinced I had killed him just as the knight had killed the ghoul. I did not stop running until I was near the ancient wall. Panting, I looked behind me but saw no sign of any pursuit. I stopped to get my breath, then asked myself what I should do now that this second dish was lost. Something warned me not to return home directly. <clears throat> and soon I had given myself over to a wave of indifference that bore me off where it willed. It meant a beating, neither more nor less on my return. So let me put it off for a time. Here was the piaster in my hand and I could have some sort of enjoyment with it before being punished. I decided to pretend I had forgotten I had done anything wrong. But where was the conjurer? Where was the peep show? I looked everywhere for them, but to no avail. Worn out by this fruitless searching, I went off to the ancient stairway to keep my appointment. I sat down to wait, imagining to myself the meeting. I yearned for another kiss, redolent with the fragrance of sweets. I admitted to myself that the little girl had given me lovelier sensations than I had ever experienced. As I waited and dreamed, a whispering sound came from behind me. I climbed the stairs cautiously, and at the final landing, I lay down flat on my face in order to see what was beyond. Without, without anyone being able to notice me, I saw some ruins surrounded by a high wall, the last of what remained of the treasury and the chief Kadi's seat of office. Directly under the stairs sat a man and a woman, and it was from them that the whispering came. The man looked like a tramp, the woman like one of those gypsies that tend sheep. A suspicious inner voice told me that their meeting was similar to the one I had had. Their lips and the looks they exchanged spoke of this, but they showed astonishing expertise in the unimaginable things they did. My gaze became rooted upon them with curiosity, surprise, pleasure, and a certain amount of disquiet. At last they sat down side by side, neither one of them taking any notice of the other. After quite a while, the man said, the money, you're never satisfied, she said irritably. Spitting on the ground, he said, You're crazy. You're a thief. He slapped her hard with the back of his hand, and she gathered up a handful of earth and threw it in his face. Then his face soiled with dirt. He sprang at her, fastening his fingers on her windpipe, and a bitter fight ensued. In vain, she gathered all her strength to escape from his grip. Her voice failed her. Her eyes bulged out of their sockets while her feet struck out at the air. In dumb terror, I stared at the scene till I saw a thread of blood trickling down from her nose. A scream escaped from my mouth. Ah! Before the man raised his head, I had crawled backward. Descending the stairs at a jump, I raced off like mad to wherever my legs might carry me. I did not stop running till I was breathless. Gasping for breath, I was quite unaware of my surroundings, but when I came to myself, 
I found I was under a raised vault at the middle of a crossroads. I had never set foot there before.